Thank you so much for your reception here. I am very honored to be in Sami homeland, and I think that we should thank uh, your ancestors for receiving us here in this land that they built. Um, I come here with a big sense of humility. I think that it is the Sami people who know better what they want and what they can and need to achieve. Um, what I intend to do in this presentation today is basically to share some ideas about different experiences, to indicate that the process of truth and reconciliation has taken place in a number of countries already, that it is not a panacea, it's not an easy solution or an automatic solution to social problems, but that it may be an important and useful step towards the resolution of ancient issues. And I want also to say that I understand that these discussions are usually extremely complicated. And they are complicated for very good reasons. Of course, um, a discussion about the truth and reconciliation process starts from a place where there is no truth and there is no reconciliation. Otherwise, we would not be talking about truth and reconciliation. It follows logically. And if there is no truth and there is no reconciliation, we need to understand why is it that there are so many conflictive positions on the issue. And not only conflictive positions, but also a lot of mistrust. I do think that mistrust is absolutely reasonable. It makes complete sense. Mistrust is a rational response to mistreatment. If there has been mistreatment for a long time, obviously the rational response will be protection. And mistrust does that. Mistrust protects us. So I am not saying that what you should do is suddenly trust each other. It doesn't happen suddenly. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen magically. I have been working for the last 17 years in a number of truth commissions, starting with the truth commission of my own country, Peru. In Peru, we lived through an armed internal conflict between the year 1980 and the year 2000. And most Peruvians suffered enormously through that conflict. I myself lost friends um, who were killed in terrorist attacks by an organization called Shining Path. And I also suffered the loss of friends who were killed or disappeared by the state forces in my country, in my university. And this happened to me, a middle class man in the capital of Peru. However, that kind of affectation was nothing compared to the affectation and the suffering that was suffered in indigenous communities in my country. You see, if there was an issue, a suspicion of a subversive activity in the capital of Peru, the police would go capture, kill, or disappear the person. But if there was the same suspicion in an indigenous community in the highlands of Peru, the army would go and exterminate the village. So the sufferings inflicted on indigenous people in my own country were massive in comparison with the suffering that we had in the capital among the middle classes and the professional elites. So what I want to say is all these processes start in a very difficult place, in a very intractable place. And mistrust is absolutely natural and is rational and it should be respected. However, at the same time, there have to be practical processes to go over the mistrust. Because the difficulty with mistrust is that it protects us, but at the same time doesn't let us move. And we need to move. And this is a question. If we need to move, we need guarantees about how is it that we move. Fortunately, 
I think that in the case of indigenous peoples, like the Sami people, international law is on the side of ensuring a process of consultation. Without a process of free, previous and informed consultation, obviously it is not possible to embark in any activity regarding the rights of the Sami people. So this process of consultation is for me the best and most secure way to go over the issues of mistrust that, I repeat, are completely understandable and completely rational. I understand that we are having a discussion about a commission and part of the discussion and something that shows how difficult this discussion is, is that there is no agreement even on the name of the commission, right? And that concepts, the two concepts that are at the heart of the commission are two difficult and contested concepts both the concept of truth and reconciliation. And I want to say that, of course, both concepts, truth and reconciliation, are very complex and difficult to understand. Um, let me tell you an anecdote. When I was in the Truth Commission of Peru, we organized hearings with the Ashaninka people, who are a nation that lives in the center Amazon jungle of my country, of Peru. And of course, since many of our commissioners were from the capital and they didn't speak a Shaninka language, we needed to organize the translation of our activities. And the first translation we needed to do was the word truth and the word reconciliation. Because the Ashaninka people had completely different concepts for both truth and reconciliation. And we discovered that we had to translate exactly all the key concepts of our discussion, because they were understood in a completely different way, from a different world perspective. So they are difficult concepts. Now, obviously, they are not just difficult, but also contested. And the mistrust that exists is linked to concrete experiences. In Latin America, human rights movements and victims of human rights violations, myself as a human rights activist, tend to have a lot of distrust about the word reconciliation. And we have that distrust for a very good reason too. And the reason is that in the past, military dictatorships used the word reconciliation to impose reconciliation. This was imposed reconciliation, forced forgiveness. The military regimes that you have heard of, the regime of Augusto Pinochet in Chile, for example, or the regime in my country, led by Mr. Alberto Fujimori, a dictator that we had, always talked about reconciliation when they gave amnesty laws to forgive their own thugs, their own henchmen, for the crimes that they committed. So we distrust reconciliation because we think that it's there is the possibility that they will impose their interests in the name of harmony, concord, reconciliation. So there is an understandable mistrust. And then you go on the other side, there is also mistrust on the word truth. Because what happens is that some political leaders will think that truth and the facts and the information about events will only provoke more mistrust and will only provoke more polarization. And so, from day one, this discussion is extremely complicated. However, I want to indicate, and I want to argue, that both elements are absolutely necessary in this discussion. And I want to talk about the man in the picture, Michael Lapsley, an Anglican priest in South Africa who I was honored to meet in the 1990s after the work of the South African Truth Commission. You see, Michael was an anti-apartheid activist in South Africa. And because of his activities, he was forced into exile and he was working against apartheid in Zimbabwe. And one day he received a letter in the mail directed to him, addressed to him. He opened the letter and the letter exploded in his hands because it was a rigged bomb. 
So he lost his hands, he lost one of his eyes, and he nearly lost his life. When I met Michael many years um, ago in the university where I was studying, he told me that he really wanted reconciliation, that he wanted to forgive, that he was prepared to forgive the man who put a bomb in the mail for him, the bomb that costed his eye, his hands, and half of his face. But there was one problem, and the problem to reconcile, the problem to forgive, was that no one had had the courage to come and confess what he did. The man who put the bomb never came to the Truth Commission in South Africa. And not only that man, but also the leaders of that man who ordered that man to put a bomb in the mail. So Michael asked, I want to reconcile, I want to forgive, but who? How can I forgive if I don't know the facts? So there is a linkage between those two things. And the opposite is also true. The truth for the truth can be very sterile, can be very arid. The truth needs to lead somewhere. And that somewhere needs to be a new covenant, which is what they understood in countries like South Africa and other places. What the Truth Commission does is at least three things. First, and, and you will notice that I call it Truth Commission all the time, because I know that the names have changed all over the place. There are countries where the institution has been called Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There are some countries, in South America particularly, where the word reconciliation was not used. They call it Truth and Justice Commission in some places. And then there are countries where the word truth has not been used. Yeah, in, in Morocco, they called it the Institution for Fairness and Reconciliation. But they were Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. So the name is important, but it's not a central issue. The name reflects an agreement, reflects a notion. But I humbly propose that this is perhaps the last discussion in the list of discussions, the last item in the agenda. Because the real items in the agenda are what this institution, what this process is going to do. And I think that what these institutions do are three things. Establish events, care for the rights of the victims, and propose solutions. Those three things. Establish the events, and these events are human rights violations, are not simple events. They are affectations of our basic dignity. So it's an investigation about a very difficult issue, and also a very embarrassing issue for the state, for society. And it should be, because they are horrendous actions. Taking away children from their families is a horrendous action. It is a violation of human rights. And establishing the facts about it is going to be difficult and painful. Second, truth commissions need to care about the rights of the people who suffer these events. And those rights are very clear. Justice, reparation, truth, and ensuring non-repetition of the events. Those are the rights of victims of human rights violations under international law. And third, these truth commissions don't investigate for the pleasure of investigating. They investigate in order to find solutions, in order to promote then what transformations are necessary, what changes are necessary in society in order to change the situation. Now, of course, Indigenous peoples, I have mentioned in the case of my own country, suffered particularly when there are um, conflicts and dictatorships. But even in places where there is no conflict, no armed conflict like my country, or no dictatorship like Chile, where there is no apartheid like in South Africa, 
Still, indigenous peoples suffer basic violations to their rights as indigenous peoples. Their uh, right to self-determination, their right to their own culture and beliefs and language, their right to their access to land, water, and ancestral territories. They are affected, even without armed conflict, even without dictatorship. So these are violations that have been suffered. We are going to hear from my admired and respected friend and colleague, Marie Wilson, how this happened in Canada. And how in Canada, indigenous peoples, called in Canada First Nations and Inuit and Metis, have suffered the violations of these different rights. And they started somewhere in the examination of these violations. They started in the issue of the residential schools. So if these violations exist, it is only natural that truth commissions that have been tried on, in over 40 countries in the world would have, at some point, examined these violations too. And that has indeed happened. But let me, of course, say that truth commissions were not originally established to deal with violations suffered by indigenous peoples. They were typically established um, in places like South Africa and Chile to deal with the violations that had happened to the entirety of the population. They were not specific for indigenous peoples. But if they have to be specific, then they need some adjustments. They need some change. And the first one, I think, is that commissions all over the world, like in South Africa or in Peru, in my country, they were commissions centered in the state. The Commission of Peru, the Commission of South Africa, the Commission of Chile. But I think that commissions that work on uh, violations suffered by indigenous peoples need to be commissions from people to people. I have just heard um, Anti saying, we Finns need to understand and we need to hear what Sami people say and what Sami people believe, what Sami people decide. That is a people to people understanding. And so it needs to be recognized that an indigenous truth commission needs to be indigenous. It's not the commission of the state for the indigenous people. It's the commission of the indigenous people. Um, I think that uh, commissions, as um, the Speaker of Parliament, Ms. Tina, has said, need to recognize that there are many forms of give testimony. The traditional truth commissions of uh, South Africa and other places have always worked on the basis of the written text. They produce a big book. And the testimony is the classical quasi-judicial testimony. We need to recognize that there are many ways to give witness. And these may, many ways to be witness may uh, and should include traditional forms of giving witness, like songs, like poems, like works of art that those are valid testimony too. Um, in Canada, again, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized ancient oral tradition as a way to establish title and deed over land, for example, because this is also a valid form of testimony. And the most complicated thing is that truth commissions working with indigenous peoples are not going to work just with violations suffered by individuals but violations suffered by a community. And that requires, of course, a different understanding too. Moreover, truth commissions, the classical ones, have worked on a specific period of time. So in my country from 1980 to 2000, because that was the conflict. In Chile from 1973 to 1990, because that was the dictatorship. Concrete, discrete periods of time. But if a commission is going to examine violations against an indigenous people, obviously the period of analysis needs to be quite enlarged because the memories are longer too. And that needs to be recognized and is a, an additional complexity that needs to be incorporated in the discussion. Now, I just want to say that since there have been so many truth commissions, Many of them have already worked with indigenous peoples. 
So this is not something entirely new. It is innovative, but it's not completely new. Guatemala and Peru are commissions that worked one in 97, one in 2001, and I worked in the Peruvian commission. These two commissions worked after armed conflict, after wars. And of course they established that the main victims of the conflict were indigenous peoples. In Guatemala, the Truth Commission established that the Mayan indigenous peoples suffered of an actual genocide. And after the Truth Commission, trials were considered against the persons responsible for that genocide. In my country, the Truth Commission found that three quarters of the victims spoke the Quechua language and other indigenous languages. Paraguay and Brazil are also commissions where indigenous people's issues were discussed. Only, differently from Peru, those were commissions created after a military dictatorship. But they found that the military dictatorship targeted specifically indigenous peoples. Chile had a truth commission established only for indigenous peoples. That is the commission called of historical, um, the Historical Commission for a New Deal. And what it did was to examine the relation between the Chilean state and indigenous peoples from the independence of Chile in 1810 to the present. <clears throat> this commission made recommendations that regrettably are still being debated in Chile about the constitutionality of the recognition of indigenous peoples and therefore the multinational character of the Chilean state. And then uh, the commissions of Canada and the commission of the state of Maine in the United States. The commissions, these two commissions are somehow similar in the sense that they both dealt with violations and abuses suffered by the children, by the most vulnerable within the indigenous communities. In the case of Maine, the child welfare system, which had an assimilationist purpose. And in the case of Canada, the indigenous residential schools, which were also assimilationist. They, however, proceeded in different ways. The main truth commission was established by an agreement between the governor of the state of Maine and the uh, leaders of the four tribes that live in Maine, the Wabanaki tribes. In the case of Canada, it was the result of a judicial negotiation between the state of Canada the Churches of Canada, and the Assembly of First Nations. But again, it was a direct negotiation deal that resulted in the creation of these two truth commissions. And differently from some others I have mentioned, were focused specifically on indigenous peoples. So what I want to say is these commissions have already taken place. We already have experience to know how these truth and reconciliation commissions work. And we already know what may be the challenges that we need to address in order to uh, decide whether that is a useful instrument. Um, truth commissions are not a magic solution. They are not going to fix all the problems immediately. And they require a lot of follow-up because the recommendations are not going to be automatically implemented. There has to be a lot of advocacy to make everything happen. But what truth commissions do, for a fact, is to make visible something that the majority population doesn't know or in some cases doesn't want to know. Because once you have a truth commission and once you have people talking in their own language, in first person, of their perspectives, it's impossible to look away. There is nothing so much powerful as individual testimony. Individual testimony is the cornerstone of truth, is the cornerstone of justice, and is the cornerstone of reparation. So what a truth commission does, and we saw that in the truth commission of South Africa, is the possibility of having direct testimony in front of the nation, in front of the country.
And that is something in which they have proven to be particularly useful. Now, I want to finish by saying, by coming back again to the issue of trust and distrust. As I said, those are rational reactions. Those are protective reactions. Those are useful reactions, actually. But since we cannot live in mistrust perpetually, what is needed is to find practical responses. And these practical responses are all about the process, not about the end result, but about the process. The end result may be called a truth commission or something else. The end result may be a process like Chile or a process like Canada or a process like Peru or a process like Finland or a process like Sami land. We really don't know exactly what the form of the output is going to be. But what we should concentrate now on is on the process itself. And I want to say that there are at least three um, tasks, three challenges that should be addressed and can be addressed even now. And I'm going to go in a different order, but the first one is that sometimes there is a confusion about what we are talking about because people refer to the same issue with different names. So some people call it a truth commission, some other people call it a commission, some people call it truth and reconciliation, some other people call it justice. So we need to have a better understanding of what we are talking about. So to me, one practical way to deal with this very complicated issue is through building capacity. It's through learning. It's through having more discussions such as this, at the local level to understand what we are discussing and to make use of the experiences that already exist. Second, I think it's important to create alliances, to have outreach. Issues of truth and reconciliation in relation to indigenous peoples have already been discussed in the UN Permanent Forum of Indigenous Issues. Under the president of a very good friend, Alvaro Pop, the UN Permanent Forum issued in 2014 a report on truth commissions in the American continent that I think is particularly useful because it's written from the perspective of indigenous peoples. The expert mechanisms on the right of indigenous peoples, also a UN institution, also has a report on access to justice for indigenous peoples in which it discusses specifically truth and reconciliation commissions. So those are elements that already exist. Those are alliances and networks that are already there. And there is, of course, the abundant experience in Canada, in Maine, in Peru, in different countries to discuss what may be the challenges and the opportunities. So that's a second homework, let's say. Establish basic alliances that are going to help us understand better and have better uh, strategies to get to the objective. And the third one is perhaps the most important one, is consultation. Meaning that anything that is established needs to be established after a process of consultation and during a process of consultation. According to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and according to international law, indigenous peoples have the right to free previous and informed consultation on any issues that engage their rights. So that means that indigenous peoples have the right to give their consent or not give their consent or retire their consent. So this means that the discussion really needs to be um, focused and really needs to be efficient and really needs to reach out to the different sectors of the community in order to get whether, how to proceed to, to, to truth and reconciliation. And I think that that means that also, even when a decision is taken and a commission is going to be established, even their con consultation needs to continue. Because there will need to be consultation to decide who are the members of this commission. There needs to be consultation to decide how is this commission going to be organized. What is it going to focus on? Those are the real um, practical discussions that need to happen. 
What exactly are we going to discuss? What exactly are we going to investigate? How are going to be our methodologies to investigate this? How do we make sure that the testimony is given and received respectfully, safely? What do we do with this information? How do we make sure that everybody knows what has happened? Those are the concrete practical things that need to be consulted. So those are three ideas and three challenges that I would put on the table, respectfully. I think that they could be considered that, therefore, we need to learn more about what this is. It's a practical thing to do. Second, we need to establish alliances with those who have already done this and who have already investigated this. And third, we need to make sure that there is a good faith consultation process. And that in this good faith consultation process, decisions are taken to move at the pace in which people decide to move. That may be fast, that may be slow, that may be in the middle. But it needs to be, it needs to be discussed. So that is what I wanted to say. And I thank you all for your patience and for your hospitality. Thanks so much.